Amen. Well, to my uh, great horror, I just realized my microphone was on through all of that. So uh, something was off. It wasn't just the bass. It was also my voice. So, man, I'm like, got those cold sweats, embarrassment type of deal going on. So uh, we're in Acts chapter 4 this morning. So if you'll turn there in your Bibles with us, Acts chapter 4. And just uh, a couple of weeks ago, we did a diagram where we talked about the four fields. If you remember that, we did it. It was the first Sunday we were down in the gymnasium in the multi-ministry building. And we kind of diagrammed the four fields and the way we said the kingdom grows. And so here's the uh, way that Jen Martin had kind of drawn it up for us. And so uh, it's a lot slicker here. So if you remember, it was an empty field. And so we had an entry strategy and then a seed sowing strategy. And then there was growth of the plants. And then we said the harvest. And somebody asked me afterwards, uh, I kind of use harvest in a, in a bunch of different places. Um, and harvest is in scripture. There's harvest that's referring to uh, souls being saved. There's harvest that's referring to whenever we're taken up into the kingdom, uh, right? When Jesus gives the illustration of the wheat and the tear, and sometimes harvest is used like in an offering sense. And so here's our simplification that Jen did for us, um, that we would say the harvest, the bundling, is when the church is gathered, right? We've been bundled together. Then we'd say that there's an open door that is a going. There's a very intentional, strategic, here's what we're going to do to go. Then there's gospel sharing, and then God brings growth. And so that's both personal growth and uh, kind of evangelistic growth. And so we see this is the kingdom process. So just to review for a moment, we have Acts chapter two, the church is gathered, right? We talked about the 10 qualities of a healthy church. They're out of the end of Acts chapter two. And what happens is they go out, Peter and John, and the Lord opens the door for them to do ministry. There's a lame beggar who's healed. He's 40 years old. And so Uh, he's healed. So that's how the Lord opened a door. But that actually was different than the gospel presentation. They did the healing and then they were able to to proclaim the gospel. So they then turn to the the crowd and they say, why do you think as if by our own power this this man was healed, but it was by the name of Jesus, the same same Jesus, the author of life who you crucified. And so they go in to present the gospel and then they're threatened. And what we find now in our section that we're going to enter is that they've gone back to the gathering. And so what we're going to see in the book of Acts is that this is the process that continues to happen. They gather and they pray. They go out, do ministry, proclaim the gospel. God brings growth, and then they come back together. And so we said a couple months ago, a couple weeks ago now, that this is the process we want to invest in as a church to see let's be real intentional, uh, to have a well-rounded ministry. And so whenever we said we're going to have an outreach starting the first Wednesday in April, uh, that is for us to be a little bit more faithful to say, hey, let's... Let's have some going, some local going that we do uh, in gospel proclamation. So I hope that you'd pray about being involved in that. So we're in Acts chapter 4. I believe we're going to start reading right here in verse 23. But before we do, let me ask you, when, was, uh, when is the time in your life that you have uh, shook with either adrenaline or with fear? Sometimes it's adrenaline. I know um, Chris is back, and he posted some pictures on Facebook that I was just thinking. I would be shaking, standing on the edge of one of those bluffs, getting ready to rappel off. And, uh, you know, if you've ever done any rock climbing, there's a moment of, like, a little bit of fear and uh, adrenaline going through. Sometimes in sports, this happens when I used to wrestle. uh, It would be common to get out of a match and to just be still shaking with adrenaline afterwards or before a basketball game would start. I remember, uh, you know, my leg would be shaking. We uh, were in a van accident one time. We rolled down down the interstate, landed upside down on the outer road. And when we got, um, you know, out of that, of course, we all lived from it. A friend showed up and said, let me take you out to dinner. And one of the guys there, uh, Chris Earl, uh, he was eating. And I remember him holding his fork and he was shaking, you know, had a nice bite of steak on there. But it was just the, the fear that he was shaking from. For me, the time that I, that I had the most shaking was Don and I had been dating for two years, and uh, we decided we would do this uh, float trip with a group of our friends. And so we said, let's meet at the camp that Don and I actually originally met, met at, LeClebe County Baptist Associational Camp. And there's a river there, so we'd go up there, and then we'd meet all of our friends and, um, and go on this float trip. Well, they weren't showing up. They were kind of late. So I said, let's just kind of walk around the campground while we're waiting for them. And that really should have been a clue for Don that we're never early to anything. So the fact they didn't show up, should have been significant, but I take her to the pavilion where, you know, we had our first conversation and I turned around and I got on one knee to propose and just to let you know, you know this, if you know Dawn, she's way out of my league. And I just, you know, kind of 
winging on a prayer here that she wouldn't realize that when I proposed. And so I get down on one knee, but I was so nervous that I've had my knee shake before, I've had my hand shake before, but my face began to spasm. So whenever I proposed, I got down on one knee and like literally muscles were just twitching. And so Dawn like had this, this look, which is unfortunately how she looks at me a lot now is like, Ugh, you know, that's who I married. No, I'm just joking. Uh, but I get down on one knee and my face is spasming as I'm trying to say, will you marry me? It was the most scared I've ever been. We've been married for 21 years. And I've been very blessed. But it was just this moment of absolute fear for me of what is she going to say? And so shaking is the word that you need to track here in Acts chapter 4 because it gives us a lot of insight. Uh, the apostles come back, and whether it be from the adrenaline uh, or from fear, they report, and you can almost hear in the way they report, there's at least an element of fear. Like, we've been told that we cannot, the authorities have said, not to teach anymore in the name of Jesus. We know we have to do it. So if nothing else, just the sheer adrenaline of Peter and John saying, did you just see that? The Holy Spirit filled us, and we told those guys, we're going to keep preaching in the name of Jesus. So there's a, either adrenaline or fear that they're shaking, and the, it drives them to prayer. They actually pray from Psalms chapter 2. We see that at the beginning of that psalm that uh, it says, why do the nations rage and plot against you? What you don't see, unless you actually read the psalm is the way the psalm ends it says in verse 10 therefore you kings be wise be warned you rulers of the earth serve the lord with fear and rejoice with what trembling so you see what happens is the apostles they go back with this trembling but their prayer actually turns their minds to say wait a minute it's the rebellious that ought to tremble. They're the ones who ought to shake in fear because they're unrepentant, right? And then what you see is at the end of their prayer, again, there's a shaking in verse 31. The place where they've gathered is shaken. And they went out and they spoke the word in great boldness. So what we're going to talk about today is this transition of them going from shaking in fear to being shaken with boldness. And really the rest of the world, from, for that matter, uh, shook at the apostles' preaching. So we're in Acts chapter 4, beginning in verse 23. If you would, stand in honor of reading God's word. It says this in verse 23. On their release, Peter and John went back to their own people, and they reported all the chief priests and the elders had said to them. When they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. Sovereign Lord, they said, you made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. You spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant, our father David. Why do the nations rage and the people plot in vain? The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers gather together against the Lord and against his anointed one. Indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in the city to conspire against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed. They did what your power and your will had decided beforehand should happen. Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servant to speak your words with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and to perform miraculous signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And after they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the word of God boldly. Father, thank you for this day. Father, we pray that you'd speak to our hearts now as we digest your word. Father, would you allow us to rightly divide it Father, would you allow your word to be powerful and effective to mold our hearts today? Lord, I, I believe you're doing a work in my life and in this church. Would you allow us to not only celebrate that, but to move that forward, Father, by the power of your spirit? Would you mold us and make us more like Christ? It's in Jesus' holy name that we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Um, well, uh, when we begin here, you see that they, they come into what they say is our people, right? So John and Peter, they, re, they return and they say they went to their people. I, I don't know if you have this or not, but um, if, if you have a group of people that you'd say, these are my people. When, when you're thinking about who your friends are, who your closest people are, that you'd say, these are my people. These are kind of flesh of my flesh. These are people that I love, that I can, that I can work with. When they go back, it says that they went to their people. Now that shows us that there's a distinction between those who are in the church and those who are outside of the church. It's, it's a clear line that nobody's saying, are you in or out? Are you kind of one of us? Are you numbered among us? The fact that they could count the people that were 
numbered with the disciples shows that there was a clear distinction. And you also see that clear distinction here as they returned. They kind of returned what would have been called the high society, right? They were with the Sanhedrin. They were with the Sadducees. They were with the wealthy and the influential. In some ways, you could say that they went from the somebodies to the nobodies. And it's clear here that Peter and John are saying, our people are the nobodies, right? I mean, they, they really went from just this, this individual, you know, these, these great individuals, the people who were notable, that were recognized in society, that everywhere they went, they would say, oh, that's, that's the Sadducees. You know, they were, they were elevated in society. The disciples were not so much. But that is only from the world's perspective. If you looked at it from heaven's perspective, they just went from the nobodies to the somebodies. Because Jesus said, if you want to be the greatest in the kingdom, become the least. And so they went from people who were great on earth, but are not in heaven. And then they went to people who were the least on earth, but were great in heaven. And they recognized these are our people. And I want you to know there's something about the family of God that there should be a clear distinction. And one of the ways that the distinction becomes more clear is when persecution arises. You go to a place like China, a place like the Middle East where the gospel is exploding in different areas, and there's a clear distinction. Nobody's saying, hey, is Bob numbered with us? Is he one of the believers? Because they're in uh, great persecution. They're only going to come if they're actually a follower of Jesus. And so for us, what we can see in our our own world today is that there is a distinction. John says it this way, there are those who went out from us because they were never truly of us. And for these people, now that persecution is coming, it's going to be real clear who's numbered with the people, my people, uh, and who's not. In, in uh, in Scripture, one way that they describe this is a winnowing fork. If you think about the farming, the way they would separate the wheat and the chaff, uh, or the wheat from the useless parts of the actual wheat, is they would take this pitchfork, throw it in the air, and it would break apart, so the useless parts would blow off in the wind, but the kernels of wheat would fall down. And so in Scripture, it's talking about whenever they had a winnowing fork, they were going to separate the wheat and the shaft. That is what trials do. And so there's trials. Officially, they've said, don't meet or, you know, don't, don't talk in the name of Jesus. Don't share that name anymore. So when the people come together, it's real clear, these are my people. And I just want to take a moment this morning to say thank you for your faithfulness. This has not been the easiest year to remain faithful. If nothing else, be, there's COVID, which is the sickness. But most people also have a really good excuse uh, it, it would have been a year ago, if you missed two Sundays in a row, we'd say, man, I, I wonder where they are. I wonder if they're okay. But now if you miss two or three Sundays, we just assume, well, maybe they're sick, and so they're watching online. And those who've been faithful to join online, I want to thank you for that. But it does really separate those who are truly of the people and those who are just really kind of following on the edges, right? This is what happens with, uh, in John chapter 6, for example. He says, unless you eat of my flesh and drink of my blood, you can't be my disciple. And what happens? John six sixty six many departed, right? And you remember, I'm not sure if it's that passage or maybe a different one that he looks at the disciples and says, are you going to leave also? And they say, where would we go? You speak the words of eternal life. And so this, this difficulty really separates who are my people and who are not. And then they give the report. And the report of the chief priest and the elders uh, had said to them, they reported all the chief priests and the elders had said to them. Then they heard this. They raised their voices together with God in prayer. So here's what happens whenever they come. They, they, they give this report and it stirs the people. Uh, in a way, you can almost think that they, they, they begin to respond in fear. I, I remember as a child, I, I would hear a preacher talk about, would you be willing to die for Christ? And that'd be a difficult situation. Praise the Lord, we don't face that in this country. But would you be willing to say, Christ is my king and I would die for it? Well, in some ways, that's what John and Peter felt like they were doing before the Sanhedrin. Jesus had been crucified. And so their declaration, we're not going to stop teaching in the name of Jesus, they feel like might lead to their death. But in some ways, it would be easier to say, I'll die for Christ than to say, I'll live for Christ amidst great persecution. Because they're actually released. And so now the difficulty is not so much would you die for Christ uh, in this momentary decision, uh, decision. It is more would I live for him amidst great tribulation. 
And they, they didn't die, so they left with this ominous threat that was hang, kind of looming over them. In, in other words, maybe I could ask it this way. You, you would say you'd be willing to die for Christ, but would you be willing to live in poverty? Would you be willing to live in obscurity? Would you be willing to follow Christ if all of your friends abandoned you, if your family rejected you? What if it was not you that had to die for Christ, but would you follow Christ if it was your spouse that had to die? Or if it was your children do you see what I'm saying? That actually makes the, the question a little bit harder, doesn't it? And that's in some ways what they're giving with the report is we didn't die, but we have a threat that's now looming over us. And so what the people do, it kind of says they, they almost wail in some ways. They cry out. For a moment, they're filled with fear. But that moment turns to a movement of prayer. And so next, next let's look at their prayer. It says they, they raise their voices in prayer. And here's the first thing they do in prayer is they give adoration. They, give, they say sovereign Lord. A way you could translate that is to say master or Lord or controller, master of the house. The first thing they do when things get out of control, this is really good. The first thing they do when things get out of control is they recognize who's still in control. For, for me, on our end, the, the world just got turned upside down. They just told us we couldn't speak in the name of Jesus. But guess what? They're not in control. You are. Sovereign Lord, controller and master. And then they go from there to say, and you are the creator. And what specifically did you create? You made the heavens and the earth and the seas and everything in them. Oh, yeah, you, you made all of this. And then uh, it's not just that you made all of this, but you own all of this. This would be in Colossians, right? That all things were made through Christ by him and for him. Th this is kind of like the, in Revelation, you might have read about this scroll that no one could open. A lot of people would say that that's the title deed for the universe. And what they, a lot of uh, commentaries would say is that God is the only one who owns everything. So when Christ comes and opens that scroll, he's saying, this is the person who owns everything. And in many ways, this is Acts chapter 4, the beginning of their prayer. Sovereign Lord, creator and owner of everything. And then if you jump down to verse 28, it's not just that he's owner of everything, creator of everything, but that he is the controller of everything. Verse 28, they only did what your power and your will had declared beforehand should happen. For them, isn't that comforting? That they say, God, you're in complete control. You're still on the throne. That's the way they pray. Then they go from adoration to biblical exhortation. They begin to pray through this passage. Now, some commentators believe that the company, the group here, actually sang Psalm 2. We have to remember the book of Psalms was a song book. And so there's a good chance that whenever they dive into uh, Psalm chapter 2, that it was a song. So if you can imagine that this persecution leads to praise, and so the church here begins to sing about how rebellious the people are, and there's a good probability that after they sang it, then Peter begins to explain it. So uh, they, we don't have the whole psalm there, but if they were going to sing the whole psalm, I'll read you the whole passage. It says this, Why do the nations conspire and the people plot in vain? The kings of the earth take their stand against the rule and the rulers together against the Lord and against his anointed one. Let us break their chains, they say, and throw off the fetters. What's that mean? It means that the rulers of the earth, uh, they're frustrated by the morals that God has placed on all world. This is, it would be called like common grace maybe or common law. In Romans it says that, um, that even though they didn't know the law, that their hearts convicted them of the law. And what the, the rulers are doing here is they're kicking back against that. And specifically, they're kicking back against the anointed one. So you continue. Uh, they say, let us break our chains. Let us throw off their fetters. The one enthroned in heaven, what's God's response? The Lord scoffs at them. Then he rebukes them. It says he, he laughs. He rebukes them in his anger and he terrifies them in his wrath, saying, I have established my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will proclaim the declare the decree of the Lord, he said to me, you are my son, and today I've become your father. Ask of me, and I'll make the nations your inheritance, the end of the earth your possessions. You will rule them with an iron scepter, and you will dash them to pieces like pottery. This is clearly here in the Old Testament pointing to God saying that he has a son that's going to be the rightful king of everything. And so their response there in verse 10, which we read earlier, therefore, you kings, be wise, be warned, you rulers of the earth, serve the Lord with fear, rejoice with trembling. There's the shaking. Kiss the son, lest he be angry with you and his wrath be kindled and you be destroyed in the way. For his wrath can flare up in a moment 
Blessed are those who take refuge in him. The, the way that ends is that if a new king had been thrown, the, the people would come in and actually pay homage to him to say, in fact, some of the translations you might have say, pay homage to the son. Uh, this translation says, kiss the son. And what it's a picture of is they're gonna kneel before and say, you are my king. And they like kiss the hand, right? Uh, it's the way that they say, you're my king. They're, they're pledging this allegiance. And so what the people are essentially praying is even though these people are rebellious and they're saying, don't proclaim the name of Jesus, what they ought to do is shake in fear and come pay homage to Jesus Christ and to say, you are the rightful king. Isn't that great? So here they are, they've, they've gone back to their people, they've given the report, and now that report has turned into a moment of prayer. So they, uh, we're the ones that are shaking and they essentially are saying in their prayer, but no, it's, it's these people, these rebellious people that are, they should be shaking. They should repent, they should kiss the sun, and they should pay homage to him, right? So then verse 29, they say, now Lord, consider their threats and enable your servant to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand and heal and perform miraculous signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. Here's what uh, they ultimately give as their request. After praying this and saying, these are the people that should be shaking, not us, they say, consider their threats. In other words, they're saying, Lord, would you pay attention for just a moment what's going on? Could you stop and just look and see what they've done? Would you consider? Would you stop and look and see what's happened? And isn't it good to know that the Lord doesn't say no here? That the Lord is intimately acquainted with all of our suffering? That he knows the hair on our head? Jesus says that if he feeds the sparrow, won't he provide for us as well? But yet the church does have a right to say, Lord, have you considered? Lord, did you notice? And that's not a a bad thing to do. It's okay for us to say, Lord, have you noticed? Now, what is their actual request? Enable us. Now, you know, because we just read, but if you could consider for a moment who's in the crowd. John, who was just chastised by the Sadducees, is there. You remember John and his brother James were called what? The sons of thunder. Do you remember what happens to them in Luke chapter nine? Luke chapter nine, Jesus enters a village in Samaria and they reject Jesus. And James and John, they do this. Jesus, you want us to call down fire on these people? So just to let you know, it it is very probable that what could have happened was that they say, Lord, consider their threats. Now is it time for us to burn them? I mean, would you, do you want us to, Lord, consider their ways? Would you like us to call down fire at this moment? But they actually do ask for the Lord to call down fire, but not for their enemies. Instead, they're asking for a fire to be kindled inside of them. Remember John the Baptist, he said, I baptize with water, but the one who comes after me, he'll baptize with the Holy Spirit and with what? Fire. Acts chapter two, what happens? The Holy Spirit comes down and it rests on them like flaming tongues and they go out and proclaim boldly. And so here they are in the moment of shaking and their prayer is, Lord, give us the fire. Give us boldness. In fact, we read this at the beginning of the service, Jeremiah chapter 20. But if I say, I will not mention him or speak in his name anymore, which is the same threat that was given here in Acts chapter four. Speak no longer in this name. And what's Jeremiah say? But if I held my mouth, my words in my heart would be like a fire, a fire that was shut up in my bones and I'm weary from holding it in. What's the church do in the the wake of the threats? They say, Lord, send the fire, not to our enemies, but to us. Make us bold. Put a fire in my belly. Make me so long to proclaim the word that I can't help but speak about it. So they give their report, they go back to their people, they pray, and then they ultimately ask, Lord, keep us from shaking. Instead, fill us with fire. And and just to ruin the rest of the book if you haven't read it, it's what they do. They, They set the world on fire, they're ablaze for Christ. They go out and they proclaim the word boldly. In fact, it's the number one way that you see this connection, filled with the Holy Spirit, the the statistically, the number one thing that's going to happen after filled with the Holy Spirit is spoke the word boldly. The Spirit came and lit a fire in them. And so these people go out and they proclaim the word of God. Their prayer, very specifically, was not that God would release them from their trials, but it was to fill them with power. So look at the result, verse 31. I think God does this supernaturally to let them know that he's heard the prayer. They're they're saying, Lord, consider, Lord, pay attention. 
And how would they know that the Lord had paid attention? Here's how. The place shakes. And after they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the word of God boldly. You see the progression? The disciples start out shaking. Then in their prayer, they say, wait, it's the rebellious that ought to be shaking. And God ends by saying, I've heard your prayer. And he shakes the place where they were meeting. Now, why did it shake? It wasn't because of the synergy, although they did have great togetherness. In fact, we'll begin uh, digesting that thought as we go through the rest of the chapter. And you could say, well, maybe it was their prayer. Specifically, was there like a pattern in the way they prayed? And uh, many people do that. They'll try to digest. If you pray in this way, then that w- that's what's going to give you pa- uh, power or maybe a certain mode of prayer. Uh, or you might say, uh, was it that they were praying the word of God? And clearly the word of God is authoritative and it's powerful. But I think ultimately the reason that there was great power in this prayer was because they depended on a higher power. They cried out, sovereign Lord. They got to a spot where they said, we need you. It's not an intrinsic nature that we have to be bold. It's not something that I could just well up and say, come on soul, be bold. They're saying, we need this from you, Lord. Would, would you answer this request? Imagine this. This is their request. Of all the things they could be asking for, they're not saying, quit the persecution. Lord, would you protect us? No, they, they don't say, Lord, would you protect us? Although that's mentioned other times in Scripture. And they don't say, Lord, would you deliver us? Although that's prayed other times in Scripture. Specifically, what they pray for here is, Lord, would you embold us? Would you give us your fire to, to preach, to proclaim? And when the place shaken, it, 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 it's not a manipulation. It's not like somebody was in the back, you know, like Peter's saying now, whenever I ask for the invitation, let's turn the AC up so that they get like the, the Holy Spirit goosebumps and they think, oh man, God must have been speaking to me, right? It's nothing like that. They don't have some of the, the grunt men like holding the, the scaffolding of the home and shaking it. Now, when we get to the end, after we say amen, just shake the place so that, you know, people will feel like God's at work. No, God supernaturally shakes the place. And, and then it's not just that. They are filled with power. And all this message is really leading to one point. For application, it, it would be this. What's happened to our power? And, and I hope you get that as an honest question. I've been in a lot of prayer meetings. And I've never been in one where the building shook. And I'm not saying we have to replicate we ha- everything we have in Acts. But in all honesty, most of my prayers don't shake anyone. I mean, if we're just talking stats... When's the last time that you prayed in such a way that it rocked your world? Maybe that you were even moved to emotions, that you wept. When's the last time you you prayed, and like Paul writes, when we don't know what to pray, the Spirit intercedes for us? When's the last time in your prayer you got to a point you didn't even know what to say other than, Lord? And there's just a long pause. My point is that The church in America seems to be lacking in power, which it writes about in Timothy, right? There'll be people who have this symbolism of God, but they deny its power. And it's not that the name of Christ is less powerful. It hasn't lost any of its power. But I think many of God's people have lost their power because they stopped praying. I want to ask you, why don't we pray? I... um, read this quote this last week. It was at a pastor's conference. At a pastor's conference, you've probably never been to one. I've been to multiple pastor's conference. They'll bring in kind of a big name speaker. And often what happens is the big name speaker is going to tell the pastor just how important they are, right? I guess part of it is to encourage them. You might recognize Brother Jim like, man, the the pastor's God's gift to the church. You know, I heard that at a pastor's conference once. I thought that's kind of laughable. But this guy said at a pastor's conference, a church will never rise above its pulpit. And man, for a long time in my life, I would applaud that. Like, that's right, man. As a man of God, you got to lead with integrity. And, you know, you're never going to ask the church to go beyond where you are. But honestly, I kind of look back at that and I think a lot of that's just hogwash. It's kind of this pathetic attempt to try to get the the people to lead to be something. But yet in our own society, we can look around and see that there are churches that, at least on the outside, looked like there was a great movement. 
and their leader was very charismatic and was a great leader, and only later on you find out that he was a womanizer or, or a money launderer, right? And so we actually look at the practicality of that and say it, it must be something different. And for us, what we have to come back to is a church will never rise above its prayer life. That's actually what you see in the New Testament. It wasn't that, that, that Peter was this great man or that John was the great man. In fact, actually the New Testament goes through great lengths to not exalt any one person other than Jesus. This is what Peter and John say. Why do you look at us by, as if it's by our own power? Peter and John would have laughed at that quote. A church will never rise above its pulpit. Oh, that's hilarious because we're nobodies. Don't you remember the Greek word from last week? We're idiots. We're not experts on anything other than that Jesus saves. But there is a correlation that a church will never rise above its prayer life. And so let me ask you honestly, how's your prayer life? Now, this would be an easy moment for me as your pastor to begin to heap shame on everyone to say on Wednesday night we had 18. The men's prayer breakfast on Tuesday mornings, we had four. Thursday mornings they meet for a time of prayer, they had two. And, and I, I, I hope you hear me correctly in this. I'm not trying to add shame to anybody. I'm just saying like, like to be honest and to look and to, to take an honest scope I would say Spring Hill is struggling in our prayer life. Uh, in, in Mark's uh, class this morning, Mark uh, McGuire, they're going over Psalms. I think it's Psalms 125. Those who, who sow with tears come ba- back with shouts of joy. Isn't it ludicrous for us to think that we should expect a harvest and not be on our knees in prayer? Ultimately, what we need is a movement of prayer in our lives. And please don't, don't hear it the wrong way. Ultimately, what's so convicting about this message for me is that I am no longer a man of prayer like I should be. And maybe it's because of COVID and there's just a lot of planning that was going on. I mean, I've got excuses a mile long. And then the building breaks and now there's phone calls and all of this stuff going on. And what can happen in my life is I, I just deal with everything because somewhere deep down inside of me, I think I could handle most things. But the apostles, they go back to their people and they basically say, we can't handle it. We have to go to the Lord in prayer. And we'll never see a great revival until as a church we realize we can't handle this. We must go to the Lord in prayer. Let me close with a story or two. This last week, I... Um, Went back to our land in McDonald County. We've got some hunting land, and so I was going to plant a food plot. And I thought, this is a good time to burn. They just got six uh, inches of rain, and there's like no wind. I check my phone. It's six-mile-an-hour wind from the uh, northeast. And so I think, well, I'll start in the northwest. I'll just kind of let it slowly creep across this field. It's going down to a pond. And so when it gets to the pond, there's pretty much nothing left to burn. Um, Just a little bit of brush down there, some weeds. So I'll start it here. I'll go down to the pond. I'll light it and let it back burn. It'll go out, and I can go on to do the next thing. So I lit it, propane torch, light a little bit here, walk down, and I'm going to turn and go light it down at the pond. And when I got to here, I look up, and it's at the pond. The wind had picked up, and I mean, it was two and a half acres. Like, I was trying to burn half an acre. And so two and a half, just on fire. And so for the next two and a half hours, I ran. I had a bucket of water, so I ran buckets of water. I'm throwing it up in the woods and off on brush piles, and I go and grab a rake from the neighbor, and I'm raking all this stuff out. And so, you know, this is just the way it is. Dripping with sweat, knees hurt, feet hurt, shoulders hurt, blisters all over my hands. And I finally get it out, you know, like, ah, neighbor shows up. Boy, that looked like that almost got out of control. Sure did, buddy. Thanks for your help. So I go and I get in the truck and I call Don and I say, man, I, I'm an idiot. I should not have done that by myself and kind of laugh for a second, hang up the phone and I uh, hang up the phone and I don't know if you've ever like dealt with fire much, but I hang up the phone and as soon as I did, I'm sitting in the cab of my truck and I think, man, I stink. I mean, I just smell like smoke and fire. And honestly, I, I knew what the sermon was about. I was instantly convicted. You have the early church that prays for fire. They pray, Lord, would you send your Holy Spirit like the tongues of fire? You told us you'd baptize us with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Jeremiah said, the the message is like a fire in my soul. That that if I hold my mouth, it, 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 
it'll just burn me up. And I sat in that truck and I thought, not only do I not have fire in my own life, I don't even smell like smoke. And I don't, I don't know if you get the symbolism or not. The thought is that it's been a long time since my prayer life's looked like fire. In fact, right now it doesn't even smell like smoke. And I want you to hear me correctly. I'm not trying to condemn anyone. But I look at our church and I say, oh, we, don't, we don't have fire. And we don't even smell like smoke. How naive it is to expect God to do a great work and not be a people of prayer. What did you think we would do? Figure it out by our own power or by our own name that we'd heal the cripple? They call, they call out in prayer saying, Lord, we need your fire. We need your spirit to do miraculous signs because we cannot. Here's what I want to ask for you. Maybe you'd look at your own life and evaluation and say, man, that describes you. To say, man, I, I used to be on fire for the Lord, but now I don't even smell like smoke. And I'd call you today to the same thing that I'd call my own heart to. Remember what the Spirit says to the church in Revelation? Remember the height of which you've fallen. Repent and do the things that you do at first. I'd want you to know that God's gracious with us. I am broken at our lack of a zeal for prayer. Um... But I know the recipe of restitution is still the same, that we repent. And I know there's not like a recipe that I could give you to say, man, here's what to do to stir in your own heart. I think even that begins with prayer. Lord, would you make me a man of prayer again? Would you give me a great zeal for you again? So I want to offer that as an invitation. And I want you to know, if this feels like it was hard for you, you should have heard the version that I preached to me last night. I just sat there and wept because there's a realization with trajectory that I can't stay this course. I can't continue to try to serve the Lord as a hollow man. I need that fire again in my life. I need to be driven to prayer. And so I'd ask you as your pastor that you'd pray for me as I pray for you that God would stir in our hearts that we'd become a people of prayer. God, would you embolden us? Would you send your spirit, maybe even first of all, to bring us back to prayer? If we're expecting revival and we have not begun with prayer, it's foolish. Father, I ask that you'd speak to our hearts today. And dear God, you know the hypocrisy in my own life, how often I preach a message and fail to apply it on Monday. Father, I ask that you would stir in me and make me a man of prayer again. Make me a man that's dependent on you. And Father, I ask that you would light a fire in my own heart, in my own soul that I could not contain. Father, you know I strive to be faithful. I strive to share the gospel as I can. But Father, I also know there's, there's times in my life that you've put a fire that I, that I long for it not just to be faithful, but that I long to talk about you and that I long to go to you in prayer. God, would you rekindle that in me? And Father, in our church, I know this is a church of prayer. Would you rekindle that in us? A longing to cry out to you. Father, we need you. Would you speak to our hearts? It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.